done. And so relationship is key here. And if we're going to have relationship, then we must have the divine presence of God. The divine presence of God must be with us. Now, now God is, is very orderly in the way in which he established and revealed his presence. If we go back into the Old Testament, we understand that God revealed his presence through his glory. Uh, it was his glory that was the symbol or result or or stood for or or signified his divine presence. It was his glory that when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, uh, they needed food and manna came down from heaven. Ah, and the Bible says the glory of the Lord appeared when the manna came down from heaven. And so glory is provision. And some people would wonder why they don't have uh, the provision of God. It's because they are missing the glory of God. They are missing his divine presence. Uh, there was another time when Moses went up into the mountain and the glory of the Lord was like a cloud and surrounded the mountain so that which the people could not enter into the mountain. Anyone that came close to the mountain would come in contact with the glory and they would be subject to death because they were not at the place to be in contact with God's glory. You see, God's glory is so righteous that no sin can be in the same vicinity as his glory. You see, if we were living in the olden days, a lot of these pews would be empty. Dare I say, a lot of the pulpit would be empty. Ah, because we would have been killed a long time because we came too close to the glory, but we weren't righteous enough to get close to the glory. You see, Moses went into the mountain and the glory surrounded the mountain. There are people, there are young people here today you're trying to go to your mountain. You want to be with God by yourself. Huh? And there are people that want to ride in on your mountain. There are people that are trying uh, to stop you and prohibit you from getting close to God. Huh? But if you would just get in contact with God's glory, God will build a hedge of glory around you so that the people that come close and try to inhibit and stop where you're going in God, they will be annihilated by the power of God's glory. You see, you don't have to cut anybody off. You don't have to tell anybody what's on your mind. You ain't got to cuss nobody out. All you have to do is be in God's glory and the glory will fight your battle for you. Somebody shout hallelujah. The glory, the glory. So glory is provision. Glory is protection. Ah, and God moved and progressed the children of Israel in his revelation of his glory to the point where he created a the Ark of the Covenant. And he told Moses to make this Ark out of wood and to overlay this Ark with gold and to put cherubims on either side of the Ark and to have them face each other. And in between, the cherubims would be the mercy seat. And above the mercy seat would be the divine Shekinah, the glory of God, so that on the day of atonement, the high priest would enter into the holiest of holies 
through the veil and would carry the blood of the animal and would sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and that would atone for the sins of the people. Well, when God in heaven would look down upon the ark, it was the glory that hovered above the mercy seat. So much that the sin, the blood that was on the mercy seat could not be seen by God because his glory would block the sin. I got news for somebody today. Isn't somebody glad that it was the glory that blocked your sin? That when God looked at your sin and when God's wrath would have been poured out on your sin, it was his glory that hovered over your sin and stopped his wrath from penetrating and from annihilating you. Do I have anybody in the house that is thankful for glory? Because it was the glory that stopped your judgment. When justice called, it was mercy that answered. It was the glory that protected you. And so our text today provides the substrata. It provides the under undergird, the, the foundation for the exposing of this spirit of Ichabod. Ah, because uh, this is a tough word today. Ah, because I, I would like to not believe, or I would, uh, I, I don't want to believe that the spirit of Ichabod is in the house of the Lord. I would, I would not want to believe that the divine glory of God has somehow been uh, substituted. The divine glory of God has somehow been extrapolated from the church. You see, the spirit of Ichabod uh, is, uh, Ichabod simply means the glory has departed. And so when Ichabod is birthed, uh, that means the glory is gone. And so Ichabod is a spirit that replaces God's glory. And so I'm a, I'm a little bit confused today because if this is the apostolic Pentecostal church, the church of the living God, then God's divine glory must be in the house. But, but, but somehow we have allowed the spirit of Ichabod to reside in our being and it begins to multiply. It multiplies like, like, like baby's kids. It doesn't die, it multiplies. And so Ichabod, that spirit has infiltrated the church so much that, that it has migrated from the pew all the way up into the pulpit. And that spirit has come to replace the divine glory of God. You see, now our text, if you were to contextualize the text and read the verses leading up to our text, you would understand that the children of Israel, they were fighting a battle with the Philistines. They were in Ebenezer and they lost the battle at Ebenezer. The ark of the Lord, the divine presence, the glory was not with them and they lost the battle. And what they decided to do is to go and get the ark from Shiloh. And they said, uh, we have to get 